Psychology and Treatment of Nash, which, uh, which is uh, done by Professor Arun Sanyal. So uh, we'll be swapping this topic, uh, the, the pancreatology topic, to the uh, end of the day. So it's, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to uh, introduce uh, Prof. Arun Sanyal, uh, who is a who is a, a hero in our uh, hepatology world. So probably you might have heard earlier, like the fame for this uh, famous Pivens trial, which you, you all know, who has done, uh, uh, we, we use vitamin E uh, in a lot of NASH patients. So he's the one who pioneered this research and uh, make it uh, appear in the guidelines. So he's the professor of uh, internal medicine, Virginia Commonwealth University and uh, Medical College of Virginia School of Medicine, Richmond, uh, and USA. So we'll uh, uh, listen to his talk on the uh, nervous aspect, possibly from uh, pathophysiology of treatment of NASH and what he, he has to say on uh, new on this topic. Hello, dear friends. My name is Arun Sanyal. It is a pleasure for me to talk to you about pathophysiology and novel treatments of NASH. Here are my conflicts of interest. The first point that I would like to make today is that NASH is part of a multi-system disorder. We often see patients with NASH who also have hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, type 2 diabetes, or chronic kidney disease. While we recognize these as risk factors for fatty liver disease, these are common comorbidities, and at the root cause are linked to the fatty liver disease through a state of systemic metabolic stress, inflammation, and fibrosis, underlying which is diet-induced obesity, and excess visceral adiposity. So what is expected of a NASH drug is that we not only improve the liver disease, but also be at least neutral with respect to these comorbidities, which represent competing threats to life. Now, from a liver-specific perspective, as the fatty liver disease progresses, we recognize this progression by increasing fibrosis. And once the disease progresses to stage two or higher, the likelihood of liver-related morbidity and mortality increases. It is currently expected that by the year 2030 in the US, there'll be about 3 million people with NASH cirrhosis and almost 400,000 people living with end-stage decompensated liver disease. And so the goal of treatment, therefore, is to reverse the progression of the disease to cirrhosis because once you get cirrhosis, liver-related mortality increases significantly. And to demonstrate that a drug is actually beneficial, reversal of fibrosis in the short term is a very strong indicator, but we have to review this in the context of the mechanism of action. And in the short term, drugs that affect the underlying root cause will first improve the NASH before it improves the fibrosis. So we have to keep that in mind. So this is linked to two concepts. First is the concept of disease activity, and the second is the concept of disease stage. Disease activity refers to all of the biological processes that are driving the normal liver into a cirrhotic state. And stage of the disease refers to how far the liver has progressed towards cirrhosis. So we recognize under the microscope disease activity in the form of steatohepatitis, which is a more active lesion than fatty liver, and by various activity scores. Whereas disease stage is recognized by liver fibrosis. So in the short term, our goal is to improve liver histology, which is activity or fibrosis or both, which is a surrogate outcome. And in the long term, our goal is to improve clinical outcomes, which is prevention of cirrhosis. And if you do progress to cirrhosis, to have less liver outcomes. 
Now, having set the stage for what we expect from therapeutics, let's now think about the pathophysiology and how the pathophysiology can be translated into therapeutics. Now, the second key concept I want to make is that the liver disease is uh, secondary to the extrahepatic milieu and the liver is a victim and that NASH is not a primary liver disease. So of the extrahepatic milieu that drives the disease, one of the key areas is the intestine. Now, when you move from a normal diet to a high fat, high sugar diet, both the fat and the sugar are easily digested in the proximal bowel and you increase the workload of the proximal bowel leading to hypertrophy of the duodenal villi and a movement of the neuroendocrine cells that are distributed from the duodenum to the colon in a certain fashion in a more concentrated northerly direction so they are all present in the duodenal villi as shown on the left. Now when you remove these what happens is that you restore metabolic homeostasis because normally when you eat, you get a gut-induced endocrine response following a meal, which is regulated with certain hormones coming on first, then others, and then later on as the food moves to the uh, colon, you get different responses. When all the neuroendocrine cells are concentrated in the proximal bowel, all of these are released together, leading to metabolic dysregulation. Now, from the bariatric literature, we learn that when you exclude food from these villi, you can actually start seeing metabolic improvement even before weight loss occurs. This has now been leveraged for endoscopic therapeutics and as shown on the right, with duodenal mucosal resurfacing, which is produced endoscopically, you can have significant defatting of the liver both in terms of absolute liver fat content, as well as the uh, relative change in liver fat. And this has now been published in gut and a major phase 2B trial with histology-based endpoints are currently ongoing. Probably a more relevant and more important uh, gut and uh, related um, pathway are the leveraging of incretins from the gut. So GLP-1 is produced from the gut and has an impact on pancreas to produce insulin. But it also has central effects which reduces appetite and can uh, lead to weight loss. And GLP-1-based therapeutics are now a mainstay of drug-induced weight loss. As shown on the left, these are data with semaglutide. You can see that within six to 12 months, you can get weight loss that is comparable to what is seen with bariatrics with 10 to 15% weight loss. Now GLP-1 has many, many biological effects from cardioprotective effects, improved coagulation, uh, effects on the insulin, improvement in glycemic state, and in the liver, it reduces fat and inflammation. And so this has now been studied also in NASH. And here are the data from the phase 2B trial. And in this trial, what we showed is that up to 59% of patients getting semaglutide 0.4 milligrams had resolution of steatohepatitis without worsening of fibrosis. This did not, however, translate into a clear-cut signal for fibrosis resolution or fibrosis regression, as shown on the right. But that doesn't mean the drug does not work. So to take a deeper dive, we looked at how fibrosis changes, and these are data showing fibrosis improvement, no change or worsening. And I want you to focus on the pink wedge over here. On the right are data for the placebo arm, where you see that 18.8% actually had uh, fibrosis worsening. Then if you go all the way to the left and work your way back to the right, as you go from semaglutide 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.4 milligram, there's a stepwise decrease in the progression of fibrosis. So this shows that when you reduce the activity, the first thing that happens is fibrosis progression slows down. You get fibrosis stabilization before you get fibrosis reversal. So each drug has its own unique signature pattern. And it may be that in the long term, if you keep slowing down progression, 
you will have less cirrhosis. And if you have less cirrhosis, you'll have less liver outcomes. So this is currently in phase three. This is a blue study that we are currently doing. Now, the field has already moved past GLP-1, where in addition to GLP-1, individuals are using glucagon, GIP, or all three together. Now, GIP reduces ectopic fat accumulation, has some anti-inflammatory effects, but probably the most important thing with GIP is that it allows uh, GLP-1 to be dosed at a higher level by ameliorating some of the nausea that occurs with GLP-1s. So GLP-1, GIP combination, tirzipatide is currently in phase two trials. Now GLP-1 is also combined with glucagon and I'm going to show the results at ASLD uh, in a week or so uh, in the Proximo trial. And glucagon of course has direct liver receptors. Now GLP-1 has no liver receptors. All its effects are based on extrahepatic effects, but glucagon is also in the liver where it has anti-inflammatory effects it affects bile production and hepatic stellate cell activation, TGF beta activation. So it may translate into direct additional antifibrotic effects. Time will tell when we do histology-based trials with these. Now, HANMI has a molecule which is all three in it together, and that is also currently in phase two B trials. Another important thing that has emerged is in the extrahepatic milieu, there is a, a dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis resulting in hypogonadism and other kind of hypopituitarism and other factors. So here are data in obese males who have NASH. And what we see here is that a very high proportion of patients uh, with fatty liver disease and biopsy proven NASH actually have hypogonadism. These are in males. And when you treat these in as we showed in the LIFT trial, the MRI PDFF, just by bringing the testosterone levels back into the physiologic range, have a substantial drop in PDFF and a substantial proportion of people improve their ALT and uh, also completely resolve their fatty liver disease. So this is an area which is very interesting and is emerging and moving into histology trials to be presented at ASLD also. Another very important uh, pituitary related growth hormone is the growth hormone rela releasing hormone, which modulates the functions of growth hormone and leads to modulation of somatomedians, which are involved in the regulation of the visceral adipose tissue. And what you see here is that IGF-1, which is a uh, biomarker of somatomedin activity, uh, basically is flat in these patients and with uh, injection of a growth hormone releasing hormone analog, tesamorelin, it goes up. And this is a study that was done in HIV induced fatty liver disease. And what you see on the left is that this leads to remarkable drop in the visceral adipose tissue and uh, improvement in liver effects. And here are the data showing an improvement in liver fat with tesamorelin. In addition to GLP-1s and these other factors, SGLT2 inhibitors have become mainstay drugs in the setting of diabetes. And so SGLT2 inhibitors are currently also being looked at in NASH, although the development is early. And it is believed that by causing glycosuria, you're moving fat into the glucose and defatting the liver. But time will tell whether this actually is viable. Now let's focus on the liver and talk about drugs with hepatic targets. So the paradigm that has emerged from the pathophysiology perspective is a four-step pathway by which NASH develops. First, by the metabolic stress produced by delivery of excess free fatty acid and glucose to the liver, which then drives cell stress and apoptosis, then drives inflammation, which in turn drives a fibrogenic response. Now, eventually progressive fibrosis leads to cirrhosis. But this also gives us targets for therapy, and you can then attack this at the metabolic, cell stress, inflammation, or fibrogenic end, and you can attack this uh, either by at the front end uh, where you have metabolic drugs, or you can put in an antifibrotic break. Now, the antifibrotic drugs have not really worked very well 
and most of the uh, current activity is at the front end where you're looking at the metabolic end of the disease. And so when you treat, attack the metabolic end, the first thing that you will see is that the disease activity, which is steatosis, inflammation, and ballooning should get better, which should eventually translate into fibrosis getting better. So here are data with some of the existing drugs, just PPAR gamma, vitamin E, these are the old drugs. There are two different studies with pioglitazone, the PIVANS trial and a single center trial from Ken Kusi that are shown. But all of these show that these drugs do improve disease activity. And they also have a small effect on fibrosis, although this was not statistically significant. The studies were not powered for this given uh, effect size. So uh, there is an effect, but I, I think we need more definitive studies to confirm that. Now, what has emerged from all of this is that PPAR gammas, which are limited by weight gain and fluid retention, work, but people want to use how to, people have been working on trying to improve the PPAR gamma effect while ameliorating its side effects. So PPAR gamma alpha is in a molecule called saroglitazar, approved in India for the treatment of diabetes and also NASH. These are data in an animal model that we ran and on the shown on the left. And what we see is that it has a lot of PPAR gamma, but it also has a little alpha effect, but has a significant effect on not only improving the metabolic status, but actually reducing inflammatory signaling in the liver. On the right is an early pilot study we published last year showing a remarkable resolution of steatohepatitis and even some decrease in liver fibrosis with saroglitazar. A major phase 2B trial is currently starting up in the US. Another compound that is being looked at are pan PPARs, where PEEP, you not only have the insulin sensitizing benefits of PPAR gamma in adipose tissue and in the liver, but you also have the PPAR alpha effects, which helps the liver burn off whatever fat does come through, and the PPAR uh, delta effect, which is an anti inflammatory effect. And this pan PPAR actually had a significant improvement, uh, lanifibrinor on NASH resolution without worsening of fibrosis, as well as in fibrosis reduction without worsening of NASH. And if you look at the combined effect of NASH resolution and fibrosis improvement at 1200 milligrams, this was highly significant. And it was also significant for uh, the 800 milligram dose. So this was just published in the New England Journal two weeks ago. And we are now moving into phase three with this. Another class of molecules that is uh, being actively studied are uh, the FXR agonists, which are bile acid agonists that bind to FXR, which is the cognate receptor for bile acids. And bile acids, when they go in and bind to FXR in the intestine, release FGF19 from the intestine, which feeds back on the liver and also has similar effects as FXR. So one of their effects is to shut down bile acid synthesis. The other effect is that it reduces lipogenesis and has anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrotic effect. Now, obeta-cholic acid is the prototype FXR agonist. The REGENERATE trial was the first phase three trial to be completed for its interim histologic endpoint. It is now approaching its final clinical outcomes endpoint, and probably by the end of next year, we'll have the early glimpse of the data with the clinical outcomes. Now, this drug did not receive full approval based on histology because it does increase LDL cholesterol. There's some pruritus. There's some potential for hepatotoxicity. So there is a whole slew of second generation FXR agonists that have been developed that are listed over here. Now, you can also affect the bile acid pathway by blocking bile acid reuptake in the ileum. Unfortunately, the Apical bile salt transport inhibitors have not been very effective in the setting of NASH. Now, here are the data from obeta-cholic acid regenerate that I show you, where you see a stepwise improvement in fibrosis improvement, but this did not translate. Uh, there was not accompanying NASH resolution improvement. So this is more working as a antifibrotic as a NASH drug. Now, tropifexor is a small molecule so it was felt that you could get around many of these side effects of OCA by developing a small molecule. But uh, the phase two results 
were not very encouraging. And here are the data that we presented last year at ASLD, showing the only very modest effects on NASH resolution and really no significant effects on fibrosis. Now, there's a lot of work going on with additional uh, artificial intelligence using uh, histology assessment to try and see if there is some improvement in fibrosis. But clearly, there was no direct signal for a major antifibrotic or anti-NASH effect of Pexor. Now, FGF19, which is released from the intestine when bile acids bind effects are in the intestine, also feeds back on the intestine and shuts down bile acid synthesis through CYP7A, but also inhibits SREBP1C, has effects on de novo lipogenesis, and reduces gluconeogenesis. And in early studies, led to improvement in the, uh, both NASH resolution and in fibrosis improvement. Now, in a recent study, the Alpine 3 study, the results were not quite as dramatic and further development of this molecule has been stopped. Now, FGFs are an interesting class of molecules because they bind to different FGF receptors and the distribution of the receptors determines the tissue specificity of these FGFs. So FGF19 uh, binds to FGF receptor 1C, 2C, 3C, as well as 4, and the 4 gives it the liver specificity. Now, FGF21, uh, which is another fibroblast factor, binds to FGF 1C, 2C, and 3C, and has different effects, particularly in the adipose tissue and through in the brain, and increases sympathetic output and browning of the adipose tissue, and leads to insulin sensitization and some weight loss. And here are data with a FGF21 analog, a fruxifermin, which shows improvement in NASH resolution. And in those on the right, as shown on the right, uh, those who had more than 30% decrease in hepatic fat fraction, a significant improvement in fibrosis. Now the numbers are very small, and this is now moving into phase 2B3 trial. And so we wait to see what this shows. Now the Bristol-Myers has another molecule called Pegbelfermin, which we showed some years ago to reduce hepatic steatosis and improve ALT in the short term. How this improves histology will be shown at ASLD in a week's time. Now, we've already talked about a number of drugs. We've talked about GLP, FGF21, SPPAR gammas, which bind to work on adipose tissue, work through the free fatty acid delivery to the liver. On the right is shown what happens to sugars when they are delivered to the liver, and which are converted through the process of de novo lipogenesis also into free fatty acids. Now, a number of uh, targets, enzymes, are involved in this process, uh, from ketohexokinase to uh, SREBP1C in this process. And each and every one of these has been targeted for therapeutics and are in early phase trials for uh, drug development with varying degrees of success. Now, P and PLA3, once the fatty acid is formed, fatty acids can be oxidized or utilized. And over here, we've shown you the data for PPAR alpha gamma and PPAR alpha deltas. I'll show you data for thyroxine beta receptors, which allow oxidation of fat. And then there's a lot of work going on also to modulate the movement of triglyceride back and forth into fatty acids through PNPLA3 and through an enzyme called DGAT inhibitor and through another enzyme called hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. In addition, uh, one of the molecules in the de novo lipogenesis pathway, sterile coa de desaturase, which is involved in the later phases of the lipogenesis, uh, has been inhibited by this molecule called fatty acid bile acid conjugate or FABAC or Aramcol, which has been shown in phase 2B to improve NASH histology. Uh, now, these results are relatively modest, but these are in phase 3 trials currently in a global trial and hopefully we will see what these show. The good news is they are extremely well tolerated and have very few effects. Thyroxine beta receptors are liver specific. So alpha receptors are all over the body. Beta receptors are liver specific. Alpha beta receptor agonists such as uh, resmetrotrom um, from Madrigal uh, improves uh, fatty acid oxidation in uh, mitochondrial turnover, reduces oxidative stress, and thus improves overall liver health. And uh, this has been shown 
to rapidly defat the liver and lead to resolution of steatohepatitis as shown on the right in phase 2b trials the phase 3 trial is nearing completion so we think in 2021 we'll have the results of the phase uh, three trial, and this will be extremely important. This is a very, very important trial, extremely well-tolerated drug, and is associated with improvement in uh, lipid profile. Uh, so uh, if this drug indeed uh, can uh, lead to high levels of NASH resolution and also slow down the fibrosis and improve, lipid pro and improve the lipid profile, will be a very important drug uh, in the context of NASH. Now, so we've talked about metabolic overload leading to cell stress, inflammation, and which then converge on the stellate cell with fibrosis. And what you see is as you go further down, the number of pathways keep increasing. So this tremendous redundancy of pathways as you go down. So if you just attack one of the downstream pathways to stop this disease cascade, other pathways are still active and overcome this. And so most of the attempts to go downstream with single targets has not been very effective. And the best effects are seen when the root cause is treated with agents that have pleiotropic effects. So this leads us to this idea that in the future, we need combination therapies. And Gilead has taken the lead here with this. Particularly, this is a very exciting uh, study that is currently ongoing with semaglutide, Fircostat, and Silofexor which attacks the GLP-1, ACC, and FXR, and which attacks different parts of the NASH uh, pathophysiologic pathway. And in early studies shows improvement in uh, ALT and in ELF uh, when we keenly await to see what the histology shows. Looking forward, we will see, we expect to see further changes in regulatory pathway and innovations in trial design greater precision in histologic assessment, particularly the utilization of artificial intelligence, dynamic assessment of histology, and more precision-based approaches using genetics as a way to guide therapeutic decisions. So with that, I will stop. I thank you for your attention, and hopefully this has given you an idea of how the pathophysiology of NASH has been leveraged for developing therapeutics for NASH.